And that's why it's a real honor to introduce our mayor. Sustainability isn't in his job title, but he's made it his job. And uh, you know, I, it, I've spent a lot of time with mayors traveling all over the world. I think they're the most creative and imaginative politicians and leaders we have now. And what Mayor Garcetti is doing in LA is audacious, it's bold, it's imaginative. His sustainability plan for the city, which was released a year ago, is gonna transform the city. And you'll hear how eloquent he is in a few minutes. I just wanna mention that he uh, has a master's degree from Columbia. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, so he's a brainiac as well. <laughs> um, and I really look forward to, to hearing what he tells us because he is making LA a leader in the field of sustainability. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much, and thank you, um, first of all, to UCLA for welcoming me back. I uh, often brag that it took me seven years to graduate from here because I went to elementary school at what's now the lab school. So I, I, I started and spent every day of my formative years here on the campus, and uh, UCLA is just an extraordinary place. I know that personally. Um, I see it now in my professional life as mayor, and Peter, thank you for what you're doing with the Institute, which has become not just uh, the strongest such entity here in, in California, I believe, but maybe in the world. Really pushing people like me, not just to say, hey, can, how can we help you and here's some advice and here's some research, but do something. It's become both a research and advocacy institute, and it has been an extraordinary part of uh, the work that we have been able to do at City Hall, so thank you for that. To all the leaders that are here from Israel, uh, welcome to the City of Angels. This is a great, actually, Israeli city, um, the largest population of Israelis outside of uh, the Middle East, uh, one could argue, um, and one of the great uh, places where we have looked for a long time for answers around the world by looking at ourselves. And there's an expression that you can see the face of the world on the streets of Los Angeles. But growing up here, and also from my early education here at what was then UES, I always found whenever I left Los Angeles, I'd see the face of Los Angeles on the streets of the world. I could be in Tel Aviv, I could be in Cairo, I could be in Shanghai, I could be in London, I could be in Mexico City, and it looked like Los Angeles. And so we've always been used to stealing good ideas uh, because it's essentially who we are here. We are a collection of the most diverse set of human beings ever to be assembled in one city uh, ever. But with that comes a responsibility, where 20 years ago that diversity was seen as ripping us apart, it's now seen as an attribute but it also comes with responsibility for what we do here in Los Angeles. We'll always have tentacles in places like Israel, uh, in places like East Asia, in places uh, from Africa uh, to throughout Latin America because we know those connections are family connections, they're professional connections, they're business connections here in the city. And certainly with Israel, we can feel that strong bond and that strong connection. We also are humble enough to know we have a lot to learn from the world, and so that works both directions. I just returned um, earlier this week from a tripartite summit in Auckland, New Zealand with our sister city of Auckland, New Zealand and our other sister city of Guangzhou, Ch uh, China. We have many, but the three of us all happen to be sister cities with each other. It's the third gathering that we've done. One was in China two years ago, then here last year, and in Auckland. And it was a terrific summit, and it was funny. Whenever we go, to your point, I, I talk to mayors and it's like we speak a language that we understand and that's more useful to each other sometimes than when mayors talk to their national governments because Really, it's looking at Auckland when I was asked in the morning show uh, earlier this week, so uh, what advice do you have about traffic and a housing crisis here in Auckland? And I said, well, funny you should ask, because we've got you know, a housing crisis and traffic in Los Angeles too. And you realize what we're trying to tackle, at least in those cities that are successful, places where people still want to come in a world that is now 54% urban and in OECD countries 80%. We're producing the great bulk, over three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions of the world and consuming that same bulk of energy. That it's cities where the action is at. And it's cities that will ultimately decide and define what the future looks like. Um, Aristotle wrote in his politics a quotation that's on the highest uh, room in City Hall, the Tom Bradley Ballroom, named for the best mayor we've ever had and my predecessor's 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 predecessor. And the saying from politics or the writing that Aristotle wrote was that the city came into being to preserve life, but it exists for the good life. In other words, cities came into being to protect ourselves from whatever was out there, the chaos, the, in this case, the global warming, other things. Cities are places we come to for safety, but that's not the end goal of a city. The end goal of a city is to find and to define what the good life means to each one of us. This weekend, we'll open up the expo line. So for the first time from the shoreline to the skyline, you'll be able to go from downtown to the ocean. 
which if you're a transportation junkie is great, but it's even better if you're just a normal Angelino who said, oh, like I, I traveled that the other day. It was about 15 minutes to go from downtown Culver City to uh, downtown Santa Monica. We weren't picking up people, but we stopped at every stop, so it'll be a few more minutes. But you forget that that's how short that distance is, because we've never driven that. I mean, maybe if we, you want to meet me at 3.30 a.m., between 3.30 and 3.45, we might on a Monday night to be able to do that. But you realize these are close places together that have for, for too long been separated by our inability to plan. That we will be able to see people going out on dates to the beach, like my grandparents used to on the red car. That's the good life, not the line itself. It's the time we spend with our families. It's the concert that we'll see. It's the sporting events that we can go to. It's those moments that a city comes alive. So a sustainable city is not just about our health indicators. It's not just about the statistics of our GDP. It's not just about what we can do to reduce the number of tons of carbon in the air. It actually is about what that translates into for each one of us. Because when we don't do that well, we know what the human costs are. I know, growing up in the San Fernando Valley at the intersection of where the 405 and 101 were. And now, in my family, we've had seven bouts of cancer, thankfully survived them all, but a cancer cluster that came from when leaded gas was right there between two freeways, I'm sure had an impact of what that meant. It's why I fight from Porter Ranch to Boyle Heights to Wilmington for environmental justice in communities that have borne the brunt of that and still do today underneath one of the greatest oil fields in America, uh, in a place where we put battery manufacturing next to where human beings live um, or store uh, so much uh, natural gas that when something goes wrong in one out of 115 wells, suddenly people feel the impact immediately and we move thousands of people out of their homes. This center today, and I, wanna, I should have thanked, by the way, the Nazarian family for their great generosity and their continuing work to, to link uh, Israel, the United States, and to be great voices of activism. Sharon and Sam are both dear friends, and Mark Gold, who heads up the Grand Challenge. Uh, where did Mark disappear to? Are you in the back someplace? Or he just, there, there he is, you know, modestly sitting in some back seat back there. The Associate Vice Chancellor is up there. Um, but a dear friend and somebody who's on my water cabinet, which isn't a, a British way of saying where you go to the bathroom. It's actually a, a, a very important group of people who are managing us through a water crisis and, and a, um, a moment which is not a, whoosh, we got through that because yesterday I was asked on KNX, asked the mayor today, well, the state's now relaxing all of its water uh, restrictions. Does that mean we're done? I said, no, they just aren't going to be the authority for the water restrictions. It's now at the local levels again. And no, we aren't done. Um, we are probably in a new normal until at least we start to reduce what we're putting into our atmosphere and until we reverse global warming, we should expect for some time that we have plenty of water here, but we need to rethink our relationship to it. We know that right now cities are kind of the fiercest weapons, armed with academics and activists and hopefully government leaders, as well as the everyday people who can translate this into something that isn't so academic and something that isn't so bureaucratic. Because for a long time, sustainability has been, for those of us who enjoy it, an issue area. As mayor, what I've tried to do is to make this a core value of all the work and all of the responsibilities that the city has. So that a fire chief is as responsibility for the environment as the head of the Department of Water and Power. My cabinet, which I bring together every week of senior um, general managers of the most important departments. I'll, uh, just last month, I was so proud when I realized this was finally bubbling down when the police chief gave me the crime report for the weekend and then told me how much paper they had saved by having the first chief sustainability officer in the last year, over 600 trees, he said, using a police calculation, uh, had been saved because they finally were conscious in a way that they never had been because they didn't see that as a core part of their own mission. Um, whether it's looking at the ways that we are kind of boldly trying to become not the car capital of America anymore, but the public transportation and transportation technology capital of America, if not the world. Or whether it's the way that we're looking at our air and our water, whether it's the way we're looking at green space and waste, whether it's the way that we're looking at making sure that environment isn't divorced from equity and economy. We put forward a now award-winning <coughs> sustainability plan uh, that I think is the boldest in this country's history, and one that I hope is inspiring other cities to do the same. And it holds people like me accountable, <clears throat> as you should, because you hear a lot of promises in campaigns, you hear a lot of goals, but then people make those promises for a time when they're long gone. I certainly inherited a bunch of those and you know, from predecessors and predecessors and predecessors that I had no role in. I'm glad they did it because they pushed, but you want to see results also in the short term as well as the medium and long term. So our sustainability plan actually, when we put it out just last year, has goals for 2017 
has goals then from there from 2025 and then 2035. So we can look at if we're going to, for instance, get to a point which one of our boldest goals to have 50% locally um, produced water, let's call it that, where at a time that only 15% of our water comes from local sources, that will require doing things immediately, doing things in the medium term and the long term. If we're going to think about not just a post-coal future for the generation of our electricity, but now, especially as we think through what just happened in Aliso Canyon, a post-carbon future for the generation of our electricity, we need to be doing things right now that are from not just the generation of our electricity, but also our consumption of it, the sources in our households, uh, in our businesses. And the city of LA better lead the way. So I'm proud that we're not only hitting, but we're surpassing some of those early thresholds, uh, that we can see half of our uh, vehicle purchases this year, our fleet vehicle purchases, will be zero emission vehicles. Um, I'm somebody who drew, drove an electric car um, from 1997, uh, the first EV1s, and knew that they'd make great fleet vehicles because of the maintenance costs, which is so much a part of what governments and businesses have fleet vehicles. It was time to do it. We're testing two Teslas and a whole bunch of I3s, even in the police department. I've always thought they'd be very good police cars because they're so quiet and can creep up on people. <laughs> But whether it's looking at a plug-in infrastructure and surpassing the 1,000 public chargers that we've talked about doing, or whether it's reducing our own water consumption as a city, as an enterprise, the city government, by over 35% at a time when all of us also reduced our personal consumption by 19%, we're showing that this isn't something we're putting onto others that we're not going to do ourselves. Again, we're going to help lead the way. So the three main components, and then we'll get to the kind of Q&A discussion that we're going to have, is really a focused on people, tools, and data. And I know lots of times we like to hear about the policy parts, because that's the sexier part of doing sustainability. But if you want to talk about smart and sustainable cities, it really is about making sure that you have the right people in place, the tools, and the data. In other words, the management of this is the most critical piece. Because we all have people of good intention here. We all make things like, we're going to get off of you know, uh, carbon generating electricity at some point, I swear, and we're going to reduce our our carbon emissions, and we're going to get more public transportation. But if you can't manage your way to that, those promises don't mean anything. Um, when we re starting with people, when we released the city's sustainability plan, we made sure that every single city department, the 27 city departments, had a chief sustainability officer in their department for the first time. They meet as a group now, and they share best practices, and they are able to, in the operations of their own departments, like I said, make sure that they own this. The police department was the example that I used. Um, when we look at the Collaboration around water, it's a great example. Um, I mentioned I think we're at 35% down in a year. But it's not just the Department of Water and Power or the Bureau of Sanitation, water in and water out departments, that should be concerned about that. It's our Rec and Parks Department, which is a huge water user. Now, that's probably a good use of water and one of the few places we should have some lawns because those actually get used. And I always tell people, you know, 90% of probably the grass that we have in Los Angeles is not used for sports and doesn't really have people on it. But how do we make sure that we can do that in a more sustainable way? Well, we're using a lot of recycled water for all of our city's golf courses. We're making sure that we have the ability to put in artificial turf where that is more sustainable uh, for places where there's a lot of soccer being used, et cetera. And, um, you know, we want to continue to expand the use of recycled water, hopefully for UCLA at, one at some point, too, uh, in the very near future. We put smart meters at some of our parks that track water use, so there's accountability in the human element as well, and allows city departments to fix leaks immediately. Um, and we also are looking at ways that we can change the way that we move around in our city. And this is where the co connection of smart and sustainable comes together. I don't know how many of you have downloaded the Go LA app yet, but one of the first things I did when I came in, it's working with Xerox. We got them, and we're the first kind of city in this country to have something like this. Go download it. When you, when you go to Go LA, you put in your point-to-point -point travel, which we do with a number of apps. But when it comes up, it integrates about 30 different uh, transportation options, from metro buses and metro rail, uh, to your car, to a motorcycle, to bikes. And we're about to launch 1,000 bikes downtown Los Angeles for the first phase of our bike share, which is going through. Uh, Santa Monica's rolling out its as well in Venice soon. Um, and it will tell you the greenest, cheapest, and quickest way to get from point to point. So three different tabs. And you can actually set your own settings. So like, I want to be this green, this cheap, and this fast. <laughs> and it will find the best way for you to hit your happy medium. Um, and you don't have to share it with friends about how cheap you are. It's OK. But you, you, uh, interesting, the fastest way always through this town is a motorcycle um, when you use the app. Not that I'm recommending that you necessarily use a motorcycle, but you get a sense of 
what this city uh, is about, and, and hopefully one day you can pay one time for multimodal travel. So you don't have to stress out about having a car and a bike and uh, you know, when I'm gonna take public transit, you can say, look, I've got this much time right now, I actually need to read a report, so I either need a car share or get on public transit so I can do that. Um, I have about 15 bucks in my pocket, go, and you pay for it once. And as you switch from the bicycle that you take out and you swipe out from downtown and get on the MTA bus and then maybe take a lift to get the last p part to your appointment, that's all paid for in one fell swoop, and that's what's coming with it as well. Um, we also put accountability forward, not just the people and then um, uh, the, the goals, but we have accountability that you all can watch. The way I manage the city for you, you can manage too, or you can watch. So I have a dashboard, which is a public dashboard, where you can see, and I've asked every department to start measuring what it is that they do. Some departments were doing a brilliant job of that. Our Department of Transportation has the best road sensor system in the world, but guess what? They were destroying that data every year. So we lost the ability to kind of learn from it. Um, so we said, keep that data. Other departments weren't even measuring things at all and thought that it was just a mayor saying, oh, you have to be a bean counter, and until they realized they could count whatever was useful to them as managers. Now, there's some goals I want them to count, but I also want them to be accountable so that whether it's the response times for a fire engine or, or ambulance uh, or whether it's the unemployment rate, I need to know my general managers are following where the city is going so we know how many miles of sidewalks have been repaired, how many roads, uh, how many, what's the turnaround time for a pothole, or even 311 wait time. When I came in, for instance, our DWP wait time for its helpline was 40 minutes at its peak. It's now 12 seconds as of last week. And so those improvements mean something, because if one time somebody calls, like let's say hypothetically the father of the mayor, and then he calls the mayor and says, I waited on phone for 40 minutes with the Department of Water and Power, that taints your feeling about that department for the next 10 years. <laughs> no, it does. And so, when we look at, it's interesting, I was looking, Southern California Edison actually spends more on its customer service, has more expense, but it has more expensive power, and um, doesn't invest as much in its infrastructure than DWP. But in ratings, it's much higher because it actually takes care of its people. You feel like your question's gonna be answered. People don't mind even paying a little bit more when they know that they're actually cared for. It's an interesting thing. I want cheaper power rates and good um, customer service for you, so I'm proud DWP has the cheapest power rates uh, in the region, the second cheapest water rates, but that means nothing if you destroy the faith that people have or lack of faith uh, with you because of your things like call times. So anyway, we've seen great things move forward. LA has become the green jobs capital of America. We've seen us install more solar than any other city in America. We're now the third largest rail network in America of any urban center with five lines underway or two of them now opening, three more to come, and hopefully this November, the ability to go for a 50-year vision of being able to do over a dozen lines and improve the transportation system for this entire city. And the same way that we're here today networking between Israel and Los Angeles, we also are trying to network globally. And I'm very proud that Los Angeles hosted the US-China Climate Leaders Summit just this past fall, something that came out of President Xi and President Obama's agreement, historic agreement, but in it it said that the cities of the two countries should come together and I raised my hand and we were able to recruit that to happen here. That usually happens in places like DC or Chicago. LA has not not always been so good about it. But it was the biggest agreement I believe in the world pre-Paris COP21 when we had cities like Guangzhou and cities like um, Beijing come here and say 10 years earlier they would cap their global greenhouse emissions in 2020 instead of 2030. And the cities of, of the US and the cities of China are responsible for 40% of all the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in this world. So having that network come together is another piece of how we're making history. Similarly, in the United States, I've launched with the mayors of Houston and Philadelphia, a network of mayors now who are also sharing best practices and requiring that we're counting our progress and sharing it with the world with the same methodology. So we have over 34 cities we've now inspired to do the same thing. So it's networking across the country, it's networking across the world, it's making sure you have the data, it's about getting the right people in there, and it's managing us towards those goals. Uh, so thank you for the passion that is in this room. Thank you for the passion that is Los Angeles. We don't shy away from big challenges, we embrace them. Uh, we don't say that this is just the role of government um, or the private sector or community or academia. We realize it's all four of us together. And I look forward to making sure that Los Angeles isn't just the greenest city, but that we actually find the good life for one another. That we have those moments that make life worth living, that we have long lives, and that we're able to find those moments of connection and purpose that is really the reason that we are here. Thank you so much.
Well, you did such a good job, and you were so concrete that he answered a number of my questions, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to make them a little bit harder. Uh, I like hard questions. Go for it. Um, and you did do a really good job in this, but sustainability is not one of those things that trips off your tongue, and it's not a real popular word outside this audience. It's, it's a word that yeah. doesn't inspire passion. Um, and you gave really great examples, but I'm going to give you the hardest sure. audience. Absolutely. Hardest audience is my 23-year-old daughter, Selena. <laughs> so what would you say to a millennial, a 23-year-old young woman who lives here, about uh, why she should be impassioned about what you're trying to accomplish in LA? Well, I'd answer it in two ways. One, which isn't quite the answer to her, but I'll get to that, is that let's stop talking maybe about sustainability and green and environment. Let's just make it something that becomes the standard operating procedure. I, I loved when green building was no longer about green building, it's just the building code, right? Yep. It, and, and of course, the building code needs to be uh, reducing our power, reducing our water consumption, so that we stop kind of, I know it's the moment when we stop feeling special because we no longer are the greenies, and we're no longer leading the way, but we need everybody to be leading, and we need to see that leadership. So that's the first piece. We don't maybe even need to have that conversation with her. But if we do need to have it with her, I would frame it in other ways. How long do you want to live? Where do you want to be? Do you, do you, what's, what are hot days like for you? Um, how's your food supply working for you right now? And do, you, do you like that, and do you want it to continue? Um, do you think other people should have, have access to those things? Do you have enough water? Um, you know, I'd frame it really like elemental human impulses, because Everybody is always related to those since the time we were cavemen and cave women to whatever when we we're going to finally get those uh, floating cars that I was promising the Jetsons. But whatever <laughs> moment in between, we want to eat, we want to live well, we want to not be too hot or too cold, um, we won't want to see our property destroyed, um, we don't want to see beautiful places go away. I think we want to see fish in the sea, I think we want to see animals uh, uh, in beautiful places. I mean, those are the moments at the end of my days I'm going to remember. And, in, in my lifetime on this earth. So I think that's what you frame it to, to a, a very distracted 23-year-old who may not know what she's doing with her life, uh, who may not know, you know why all the other distractions she's trying to figure out why this fits into it. I think it actually brings it to the core of everything she's thinking about. Great, thank you. you uh, tell her to call me if you need it. Yeah, so I'm happy. <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> um, you mentioned in your, in your talk about the role of the business and, and the public. Can you get, so, that role needs to be done differently. Mm -hmm. what, what does the business sector need to do differently? And, and what do we, each of us as individuals, need to do differently to achieve your goals? Um, I, think, goals actually. I think we have to look at really simple strategies. Um, I was in Hollywood yesterday at one of our homeless uh, navigation centers that I'm trying to grow and, and find other locations for throughout the city to really head on, uh, start reversing the tide on homelessness in our city. And I talked to a, a Navy veteran who we had helped house. He, he now lives in Lincoln Heights, but he comes back every single day to uh, Hollywood to see his friends, because it's also about building community. And uh, he said, oh, I've always wanted to meet you. The first, when I've moved into my home, the first thing I heard on the radio was you and Steve Carell talking about Save the Drop, which mm -hmm. was this ca campaign we put out. And Steve Carell um, and I did a, uh, he was funny, and I was the kind of straight man in his comedy to say we should save water. And um, I was also reminded of a class from, I think, Temple Israel of Hollywood came by, fourth graders. Um, it was only a couple weeks after we'd launched the campaign, and I showed them the drop, and they're like, I, I didn't cue them. I said, who's this? And they said, it's the drop. Um, and I knew that having a cartoon character suddenly, and, and a radio ad, was a very simple way to engage popular participation. And everybody said, oh, you're taking the easy road, you need to find people, you know, there's, you know who you are, the disciplinarians in here, you want me to go out there and ticket people, uh, find your neighbor, put them in handcuffs. I said, I kind of trust people's ability to do this. And I think at the popular level, we have to really start thinking about doing most of what we're doing at that level. For businesses, um, I think similarly, we have to make it I'm very practical this way, really about bottom line. I mean, when, when I talk to people about reducing their bills, we know that the rate for water, for power will go up over time. It goes up sometimes with inflation, sometimes beyond inflation because of the state mandates and other things. But when I frame it not so much as, oh, do this to be green, but hey, don't you want to save some money? Are you using that lawn? Suddenly people start thinking in a very selfish way. And I think with businesses, that's the most important one too. They won't have customers if they don't do some of these things. Uh, every building owner that early on adopted green building stuff actually are, has, have the lowest operating costs. So they're beating their competitors just in renting commercial space. 
um, you know, it, they probably came out of a combination of their hearts, but it, it embeds itself with its head. So I guess long term, I'm very practical about, you know, mass communications with business sector, make it in their own interest. And I think California is the great example, right? We don't even have to say this much anymore. The old, this, the old divide between jobs and environment. It's like California, it, you know, we have all these governors who come here. The governor of Texas comes here. The governor of Florida was the latest to steal our jobs. It's like, bring it on. You know, yes, we have more regulation. Yes, we have higher taxes. And we do need to look at those things sometimes to make sure we're not just piling on too much. But we're producing not just the most jobs in America right now in the recovery, but in the top five per capita. Like, had, you know, we're, we're neck and neck with Texas, which is like, hey, we have no laws and we have no taxes, is kind of their pitch. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you can go that, that route, but secretly, that's not even who Texas is. They're generating so much of their power from wind now um, because they have forward looking people who kind of saw it in the bottom line um, and, uh, you know, put, them, put it down there, and it's going to be smart for that state. Great. And there's another thing we have over Texas. We don't allow kids to carry guns into that's the right, university that's campuses. Right. <laughs> so, um, True um, that. <laughs> it, I, my, my family's back east, and a, a lot of my friends live in places like Montana and Wyoming. And you know, I know what LA is doing. I, I recently moved here, but I think LA still has sort of a dystopian reputation. Mm -hmm. You know, the people think of it it's like Blade Runner or something like that. Um, what you know is the, is the message getting out? Do you have signals from your travels and that, that, that something's happening there. I'm just curious. Yes, I'll answer it two ways. One is that I think we do still have a dystopian reputation to some extent, and that's a good thing. And I'll tell you why I think that's a good thing. Because it's less dystopian than postmodern. Uh, the old cities are places with centers. Yep. They're vertical and they're bounded. Tomorrow's city is not uh, vertical, and it's not centered, and it's not bounded. And LA's ahead of the curve in that way. Um, so the requirement of megacities, we've been a megacity for a long time. So we're a little further ahead about how do we take these immense spaces and start to actually make public transportation work or experiment with the next set of, of technological innovations, whether it's ride share, autonomous vehicles, or Hyperloop, you know, or being able to crunch some of those spaces together and make things sustainable. Um, on the other hand, we don't just have that reputation anymore. I mean, there is a real, um, there's a real sparkle in people's eyes now when they're like, I hadn't been in LA for about 20 years, but, and we've all had those conversations, right. but they're like, wow, you're downtown, your art scene, like, you know, it used to be what New York had in the 1980s, but nobody can afford a studio there, and soon not here, but at least they can now. <laughs> um, you know, there's this moment where the world is looking to us, and don't take my word for it, I mean, the, the Guardian, you know, the yeah. UK paper, did a thing on just brand strength, um, and they put in a, some sort of formula that was based on weather, crime, economy, social media buzz, and they put all this, the top 50 cities of the world in there. And it, what coughed out, number one, was that LA had the strongest brand strength above New York, above London. Those were the top three. And I think we're used to kind of saying, yeah, we're probably top 10, and we're getting better. But nobody thinks of our, ourselves as number one. And we are, in so many ways. We're the trade capital, the tourism capital, the green jobs capital, entertainment capital. We've been used to that. Aerospace capital, manufacturing capital of America. Um, and, and I think, increasingly, the cultural capital of the world. So, Part of it is, is not, it's not a bragging sheet, It's because with that ranking comes a lot of responsibility. But if we can show what a postmodern city, how you could take a potential dystopia, because you do see those sprawling cities become dystopic around the world, and show a way forward that continues to make it livable, I think that will inspire a lot of uh, conversations with cities that, quite frankly, other American cities can't have, because a, you know, a Shanghai doesn't see themselves uh, maybe in a Philadelphia as much as they might in a Los Angeles. So uh, we only have time for one more question. So this, uh, and you've been so optimistic, so I have to give you one <laughs> sure, a sure. chance to be a little bit pessimistic. Uh, not really. Forget all I said. It sucks. We're yeah. all going to hell. <laughs> uh, enjoy living at the peak. It was good. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, the goals of sustainability for the city are incredibly ambitious. And you know, I've heard some people remark that they're, they're unrealistic. I don't think they're unrealistic. But you certainly are aware of the obstacles. Yeah. When you pause to reflect on it, what, what do you worry about your biggest obstacle is going to be? A couple things. I, I um, worry about our uh, um, continuing our relentlessness. I think there are moments we all as individuals in jobs and in titles that we have um, and at the beginning of things or towards the end when you feel like I've got to make my mark or I'm leaving and I better have uh, created a legacy, that the time in between who's going to continue to be relentless about this. Um, 
I, I worry um, about steps backwards sometimes when we see kind of, we get lazy about organizing political power. I mean, I don't know what this election will bring. Um, uh, political power has consequences. You can see that from what just happened with the uh, AQMD um, to what could potentially happen in the presidential elections. Um, I worry um, that the challenge is that we're so far behind on some of them that we will have a lot of losses, even as we try to seek victories. I don't know what's gonna happen to life in the oceans, for instance. I mean, uh, will, we, will, will our children be able to see fish in the ocean, um, you know, beyond a few species? Um, I, I worry about uh, um, kind of the creative commons um, and whether those will exist. Um, and, and I worry about whether um, our relentless drive for growth, which is a necessity kind of of being able to reinvest, um, will be a paradox, that the growth comes with inevitably a consumption of resources. And we need that growth in order to innovate because we don't have capital to do things like rethinking our public transportation without it. But at the same time, does it drive something like a, a housing crisis that makes it really difficult uh, for this to be livable? So there's your stressful points to think about a little bit. Well, thanks for being such a rational optimist. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you all.